So um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. And so just to um, make it clear for everyone, because um, we have uh, members on the phone, <clears throat> if we do take a vote on anything, then we will um, need to do a roll call if there's a disagreement. Uh, that That's your understanding as well? Uh, Bill or Cameron? Yes, indeed. Um, yes. Okay. Um, I don't know that we will be voting on anything tonight, but just in case. Um, so, uh, just to um, uh, look at reviewing and approving the agenda. Um, so, the um, one of the items on the agenda tonight was the city council workshop, and I anticipate that we're going to. Oh, we're going to be putting that off um, tonight, uh, and so uh, really we're just going to be talking about um, city's response to COVID-19. There was an email that was circulated to everyone just prior to this council meeting um, uh, coming together tonight, so that was an email from Cameron at 521 today, and I think that is going to sort of lay out what, what we'll mostly uh, go through. Um, uh, and then I, I also, I don't see on yeah. the agenda any opportunity mm -hmm. for public comment, um, but assuming that, you know, since Stephen Whitaker is there, I assume you would like to say something. Um, and so I would love to, uh, you know, add that, you know, um, item on to, if in case there's any other, um, you know, comments from the public. Uh, does that sound like an okay agenda to everyone? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, Stephen, um, what is your thought? If you could, you know, do, go through the regular uh, drill, your name, uh, where you live, and um, and also try to keep it to two minutes. He, he's passing for now. Oh, he's passing, okay. Great. Um, all right. So, um, uh, okay. So moving on. Uh, so uh, for this part, uh, does everybody have the uh, memo? Uh, memo. Yes. Yes, I have it. Yeah. Yes. I just emailed okay. it out to all of you. Anyone? Oh, okay. If anyone doesn't, um, you know, please um, no. speak up. But um, otherwise, uh, Bill or Cameron, I might. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to. Um, to walk us through this, if that makes sense to you all. Otherwise, I'm happy to do it. Yeah, so that's great. Uh, what we thought we would do tonight is walk through, the memo is basically in three parts, or at least two parts. One, to talk about what we've done already, or, or are doing. Two, um, some suggested actions that we think the council could take tonight, if they'd like. And then I think the third part of the meeting would be for some brainstorming um, from uh, the council as to other things you'd like us to look at for, for future meetings. Um, and we do have one more member of the public, Adrian Brownlee is here now as well. Um, so I'm gonna have Cameron walk through the, the memo since she drafted it, and, um, but we'll both be offering comments as we go through. All right, so um, to keep you guys fully informed and to make sure that the public understands the sort of full to date response um, that the city has taken in response to coronavirus, I'm just going to walk through this memo. Um, regarding closings and remote access, in order to continue to provide core services to residents, um, the city did limit access to its public buildings. We closed all offices in City Hall except for by appointment. Um, accepting the city manager's office, which remains open um, normally. Uh, we've required that city council meetings continue as scheduled, but also we are communicating remote call-in options to interact with council and the public. We will um, probably next week have a little bit more advanced options. Um, hopefully we'll get you all on a screen next time. Um, other city facilities, such as the senior center, rec center, the garage, the water treatment plant, wastewater, police, and fire are currently closed to the public. And then we've asked our committee members to either cancel any non-vital meetings where no decisions needed to be made um, or 
have them by remote access. So just so everyone knows, staff has to be on site or a member of a committee has to be on site during those committee meetings, just so if the public does want to attend, they can attend in person. We've also canceled all of our events and programming or we have either, well, or we've postponed them for further notice. So we're also, to address any concerns about the continuity of our operations, we have all been working on and updating and enacting our continuity of operations plans. Um, these ensure that we maintain our internal capacity to provide our residents their core services. Um, in addition to that, departments are working really hard with other jurisdictions to create mutual aid support and agreements, um, specifically our wastewater and water plants, um, just to make sure that we have shared trained staff between all jurisdictions to support each other. City staff has also, as we've said before, increased our frequency of scheduled cleaning. The senior center and the rec center have also hired on a part-time worker to help them clean that facility because we know that that is a vulnerable population. We also want to ensure everyone that our city employee benefits are um, you know, bolstered during this time. Our individual department directors are allowing their work, um, their employees to work from home if their work permits it, um, and other social distancing options. If an employee is formally quarantined by their doctor, they will be paid administrative leave for those two weeks away from work. We are also not letting our staff run out of sick time for COVID-19 related illnesses, and they can borrow sick time, so they will be paid the whole time they're out for that illness. We're also working on implementing a child care option for city staff, depending on guidance from the state, so that we can continue to provide core services to the residents of Montpelier. We are looking pretty deeply at the budget impacts of this situation. We understand that we're probably going to lose a lot of our local options tax from hotels, the Rooms, meals. meals, and alcohol. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, so we're also looking at those projections and what that's going to mean for the city budget. We're also looking at how we determine our financial standing and opportunities for cost savings. So if that includes projects, hiring, et cetera, we're really looking at how we can um, curtail any costs. I also want to say how we've been communicating during this time. Uh, we have updated our website to have a front page button that directs people to sort of a clearinghouse, we've been calling it, um, of information regarding um, official sources for COVID-19 information, as well as community resources, such as volunteer opportunities. So we've gotten a, quite a few um, locally run and advocated groups that are doing really good work. We want to make sure that people can get connected to them. Um, we're also updating our front porch forum and Facebook as often as possible. We've also been in constant contact with our state and area partners to make sure that we're up to date on any best practices for this response. Um, this also includes outreach to our churches and food pantries to offer any guidance and connect them to volunteer networks. We also want the public to know that we have a lot of online payments and services options. You can pay quite a few things online through our website like property taxes, water bills, dog license fees, et cetera. Um, we also have quite a few online city services um, that you can uh, um, access at any time, including parking ticket appeals, uh, birth, death, and marriage records, and other services. Um, we know that this uh, illness is really affecting the vulnerable population, so we wanted to address that briefly. The Senior Center's Feast or Meals on Wheels program is really a top priority for us. We've transitioned into making all of those meals to go and are always looking for volunteers to help deliver meals, but they have really been working on their contingency planning and feel very comfortable where they're at right now. We also know that the police department is closed because it is our emergency operations center, and so that really disrupts our 24-7 bathroom access. Even though people can be buzzed in there, we know that is a barrier, so we wanted to address that by putting uh, two accessible porta john units out in um, areas of the city. We'll have one behind City Hall in the parking lot there, and an accessible unit also behind the senior center. Um, the one for the City Hall lot should be delivered tomorrow, and the other one at the latest should be early next week. Um, our rec department is doing a lot to try to help um, our community stay healthy mentally and physically. Uh, they're putting together a really great list of activities that people can do while still socially distancing themselves from each other, but should still be able to be active. Um, 
and they're also cleaning out any of our external um, hard surface recreation facilities like our outdoor basketball courts so that people can still have recreation options. We also talked to the high school and they are providing breakfast and lunches for children to pick up at the loading dock. And our rec department will be working with the school's food services director to ensure that lunches are still being distributed and if they need any help, we can help them. Regarding the most vulnerable population that we have in our community, the homeless, um, the Washington County Homelessness Response Team has been pulled together and our Your City Council's Homelessness Task Force is working with them. Um, the representatives on this facilities like our outdoor basketball courts. <laughs> um, other representatives on this team are the State Department of Public Safety and Department of Health, the Central Vermont Hospital, Washington County Mental Health, Capstone, and Good Samaritan Haven. They're leading local response and have created response groups focusing on congregate recovery sites, medical support, transportation, food access, street outreach, volunteer management, and training opportunities. So the Washington County response team is also working with the state's health and human services to make sure that the state's EOC is getting real-time information. They're also working with the um, Office of Economic Opportunity to open up some pathways to getting motels and hotels for folks so they don't have to stay in the shelter. Locally, Good Samaritan is working really hard on lowering the concentration of folks in the shelters to get to that 10 limit um, and have found alternate shelters for many, including hotels and motels, and in one instance, an empty area college dorm. So that sort of brings us to um, the place where we were looking for potential action items and input from council. Can I just really quickly make yes. a couple corrections, just because I know that the press is probably listening and I don't want the correct information to go out. In terms of clerk functions, uh, it mentions dog licensing fees and business license online renewal system. Those are both limited. Get and here, who's talking? Okay. The, uh, just, just for information, a couple corrections from the clerk's office. Uh, it talks about dog licensing fees and business license online renewal system. Both are limited and both uh, deadlines are off until further notice, which has been pretty typical of clerk's offices, so we're doing that too. So we will not be looking for the dog license renewals or the business license renewals uh, until a later date. Also, the birth, death, and marriage records we have, it's not 2012 forward, we have them back and available to look at online uh, to about 1907. Well, I recommend that we update our website. <laughs> That's on the website? Yes, it is. Oh. Not my part of the website. Yes, so we'll make sure it gets changed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I ask a question about um, city services? Of course. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that it's really clear, um, particularly you know for members of the public and um, uh, and to ourselves that uh, particularly during a time when um, businesses are um, many of them will be closed that we will continue to have police presence uh, downtown um, you know anticipating um, you know just knowing that there was uh, an increase in vandalism in Middlebury and um, you know just want to make sure that people know that um, the, the police are still out and, and actually I'd love to encourage uh, businesses if they can to keep uh, their, the lights on, at least even uh, on the outside of their buildings. Um, but I, I assume, uh, obviously, that that's correct, right? That that our police presence is not any less. Yes, that's correct. Chief Fakus is here. If you if you'd like him to address the issue, but uh, in fact, his directive has been to be even more visible than even normal to get people out and about in the community uh, as a prevention message, but also. Uh, we're here to help in whatever ways we can, uh, and we're looking at other ways just to have city officials out uh, available for people. But definitely the police presence is going to be um, continued and expanded. Okay. As long as I don't we have healthy think staff. I need to address it. Sorry, go ahead. I said as long as there's healthy staff, sufficient healthy staff. I just add, and we've talked about this before, but just to repeat, um, you know, we are working with groups like uh, Cameron mentioned, the, the county homeless response services and others, and uh, trying to 
keep as many resources as we can. Um, we are, you know, really focused on maintaining core services, making sure we can keep the clean water running, our wastewater treatment uh, functioning, our public safety response, both police, fire, ambulance, uh, basic sewage, you know, water and sewer lines functioning, our, our maintenance, those kinds of things so that people can get around and do the things that they normally do. And um, we are assisting with human services uh, items and economic development items as we can. Those aren't necessarily the city's uh, expertise, but we are certainly in contact with everybody. We'll provide whatever assistance and leadership that, that we can um, within our means. Also, something that touched on, but um, we are looking at the budget. Uh, we know that we would love to do a lot of things and perhaps provide uh, financial assistance somehow into the community, and, and that certainly may be possible. But we also note that uh, we anticipate particular shortfalls in a lot of areas in the budget. Most, uh, I think, immediately the rooms, meals, and alcohol tax, since uh, restaurants and bars are essentially closed. And, uh, and people are being discouraged from traveling, we, we expect that that will drop off uh, very dramatically. Parking, of course, uh, and we're gonna talk more about uh, that, hopefully uh, the council will agree to end any parking uh, meter rates and, and enforcement tonight, um, but that will drop off uh, and, and s s you know a lot of our functions are funded directly from that parking fund. Certainly, activity revenue from the rec department, senior center, I mean, those are used to fund those activities, but there is usually a little extra that helps uh, support those operations. So we are looking at the impact of that. We don't know what property tax payments will look like in May. We are recommending that um, that, that deadline be extended by 30 days to help people out uh, from May 15 to, to June 15. But Typically, we have very high collection rates here. Just people tend to pay on time. Uh, we will see if that changes uh, as people's uh, income is changed. And uh, so all of this means that we are trying to identify areas where we can reduce the budget. We're, we're putting extra uh, layers into the hiring process before we, we hire vacant positions. We are looking at projects and equipment and purchases and ordering everyone to cut back. Um, so while we would love to free up money to go into community services, we also need to free up money to um, cover anticipated revenue losses. Oh, Bill. So I, I oh. feel like that tees us up well for um, potential Correct. action and, and that the council could take. Dan Richardson Sorry, yeah, wanted to add something. Well, I just I actually had a, a question um, before we do move on to the next topic. Um, is Bill and Cameron, what, what are the, as far as the services, the core services that the city is providing? Um, Dan, you're hard to hear. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and speak louder. How's that? Um, I think you, you got to get into the mic. I am speaking. You're turning the mic up. Yeah. Um, two questions. One is, you know, have there been any hiccups or any issues with providing the core services so far? And second, do you foresee any? So far, there have not been. Um, I mean, we haven't had a complaint about people being inconvenienced uh, for the offices. I, I suspect to some extent there, you know, there will be. But certainly, so far, we've been able to fully staff our, our services. Uh, the hiccups will come when people start getting sick, and we've got to cover those costs. Uh, as, as Cameron mentioned, for things like water and sewer treatment, public works, we are looking regionally. I think the police and public safety people are doing the same uh, to how to cover each other as, as different departments have shortages so that those core services can be, be uh, maintained. Okay. Oh, no. oh. So, do, do you see us maybe <laughs> hearing Connor speaking? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, in addition to like tightening the belt, you know, partial hiring freeze, you know, equipment delays, do you see the need maybe in the next few weeks to have sort of a like menu of a rescission plan for the current budget um, that we'd actually have to vote on? Possibly, but, yes. We're we're running those numbers now, and we would we will probably at least try to get you a status report within the week, and then if we need further action, we'll take it from there. 
Um, Bill, the question was kind of hard to hear. Sure. Could you just uh, repeat that question? I'd be happy to do that. I'll try to remember to do that every time. So Connor Casey asked if, um, in addition to just tightening the belt, if there was going to be a rescission plan presented to the council in the next couple of weeks to help balance costs. And I said, possibly, we are going to be running the numbers and we'll provide you a status report within a week. And if there is a need to take formal action after that, that would be on the agenda coming up shortly. Okay. Great. Thank you. And uh, Lauren, did you have a comment? Oh, just a couple of questions looking through. And this is super helpful. Thank you to um, Cameron and Bill and the rest of the staff for pulling together. I think this information is great and incredibly helpful to have all in one place this memo. So thank you so much for that. Um, Looking at, one thing I was curious about was, um, I mean, one thing you mentioned was like that we need an, an in-person study. I know the legislature is actively looking at trying to undo that for emergency situations so we might get to a point where that will no longer be the state law, so then we can obviously respond to that so we can all keep an eye out for that and just underscoring, like you yeah. say, video meetings are so much more productive. So yeah, Lauren, 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 could you, could you say that again, maybe a half step slower? Uh, most of us missed it. Oh, sorry. So I was saying one, probably people saw, but the legislature is looking at undoing the in-person requirement oh, um, for meetings. So if we can all keep our eye out for that, but that's Correct. they're looking to do that. So um, then we can, you know, respond. And then, um, one thing I was curious about was, so, you know, watching what's happening in some other parts of the world, if we're getting to a point where getting quorum might be difficult or need to stay home, like, could you just walk through what we're all here and could understand, like, what's the, what's the sequence of how we deal with things, like, if we don't, if we aren't able to get quorum or who's in charge, if you and Cameron are both out, for example, like, is there, or is there, like, a good memo on like succession and decision making if things become particularly you know challenging um, we're putting that all together. Uh, right now, there, I mean, we've checked on state law, and actually there is no provision for emergency action if, if less than a quorum is available. Um, and obviously, I, I suspect we're not the only people looking at that. Um, you know, and I, and you, I mean, this is a different situation where people are more likely to be bedridden, but you, know, you wonder what would happen if there were a, a major tornado or something and a bunch of people were killed and you couldn't have a quorum so uh, you know i think that's a fair question we will have a succession you know line of succession here at the city again we're not necessarily expecting i mean we don't know but that people will be so out of commission that they can't at least answer a question or something but um certainly we will have thought that through uh, from a staff level and we're trying to make sure that we understand what things you know we have a our charter we couldn't find anything unique in it as far as is the council but um un, unlike the general statutes for towns and cities because we have a manager plan uh, there are certain administrative actions that can be taken by the staff um, and we just may have to outline like in an emergency situation what the council wants that to happen or what those parameters are and um, we're looking at all of that Employees 
in far different situations as far as their leave. Some people have, you know, loads of leave, you know, sick leave time. Others that are relatively new don't have much. Um, and so our commitment is to make sure nobody goes, if they're sick, that they'll get paid. And it will probably, if, if something extraordinary happened, we'd consider that on a case-by-case -case basis. Right? We really want to make sure people s stay whole. And, but we're also being trying to be careful that we're focusing on this particular sickness. Um, not, we, we, we feel very fortunate we don't have abusive sick leave within the city government, and, and our, our employees are exemplary. But we also wouldn't want to create a case where um, suddenly we're creating, you know, Sarah, for any other outage or illness. You know, that, that will be handled the way things normally are. But for this particular illness, the quarantine time, sick time, um, we're certainly taking that into account, as well as people who are forced to stay home. You know, the sick leave law allows it to be used for child care. And so we're trying to take a liberal view of that as far as, um, you know, people that are now in situations with their kids at home that they weren't expecting. Uh, but we're also cognizant of the fact that many people in the community who are paying these bills don't have those benefits. So we're trying to balance the, you know, the cost and expense to them um, and really using this as a way to make sure we can keep delivering the services that they're paying for. Um, Bill, on that point, um, is, is there a short-term disability? Yes. And, and when does that kick in? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say 14 days, but it might be 30. We can get you the idea. Okay. I, I, I'm not necessarily concerned about the exact, but it's, it's good to know. I mean, because that, that strikes me as another sort of tool in your toolbox. So if there is an extended leave caused by illness, that's usually when that type of coverage would... would that's correct. And that's what that is typically used for. Okay. I was not able to hear that last okay. comment. Yes, thank um, you. So the question, the comment from... I can from, hear most of what Dan said. The, the comment can... from Dan Richardson was that, uh, was asked if we had short-term disability coverage and when it kicks in. And my answer was, yes, we have it. It's either 14 or 30 days that it kicks in. It's It's been both during my time, and I just can't remember off the top of my head which one it is. But what that means is if somebody is sick for longer than those periods, they go on a short-term disability plan, uh, and that saves their use of sick leave. So people with a, you know, and that goes for about, I think it's six-month period. So people that have an extended illness beyond two to four weeks uh, are protected anyway through that plan. Just, just following up on that, um, are we having regular meetings with the uh, heads of the bargaining units just to make sure, you know, some, some of the stuff outlined in the memo said you might be working outside the scope of your duties a little bit, so I just thought there might be a need for a side letter or something in some of those contracts. We've had, uh, we've had preliminary conversations as it, as it so happens. We are scheduled to begin bargaining with two of our units, so we've been in meetings with them already, and in fact are talking about maybe um, pushing those off. I think even you know the union members feel like this isn't the time to be asking for more things. Um, but so far, they've been very receptive to doing what, um, what needs to be done um, within reason. Okay. We have, I think, you know, I don't want to speak. I'd let the union speak for themselves if you want to ask them. But I think we've got pretty good relations with our, our units. And they've always been extremely cooperative. And when we've had times of crisis in the city, uh, no one's worried about union or management. Everyone's risen to the occasion and just delivered. And I think that's across the board, police, fire, public works, and our non-union staff. So I have co full confidence that our folks will do what maybe needs to be done. Um, Mayor, I think Stephen Whitaker wants to say something. things. Um, one, I, I raised the issue from another meeting that, uh, and it was very questionable whether you can chair a meeting not being in the room. Uh, that it, it makes it very difficult to see who's talking or to moderate or to hear. Um, just file that one for later. Uh, as far as changing or in, having input to the legislator, legislature or the Joint Rules Committee, uh, this is this discussion is going on nationwide about whether to change meeting open meeting requirements 
And this is a perfect example of the combination of three telephones and squeaking audio and, it, you know, it, painful distortion, et cetera. Um, this is not something we should do haphazardly, especially not compromising participation rights. In this case, we're recorded, but will all meetings be recorded? Is ORCA going to show up for teleconferences or be contracted to engage in teleconferences and make sure there is a recording for those off asynchronous review? Um, those are all things to consider. Um, I first want to propose that the city, um, well, I guess it's second, that the city assign a point person to uh, address the needs of the most vulnerable. Do not be rest, uh, lulled into thinking that this countywide group, we don't have county government here, by the way, this county group that's had a few phone calls is, is letting the city off of all its obligations. There's a, the city has an obligation to its vulnerable populations and it needs to be stepping up now, not backing off further, thinking that this brand new, you know, county level coordination has got it all under control. Um, I did review a memo, a 10 page memo that came out of that process yesterday and it says plan and plan and, and find a couple of buildings where you can stick all the homeless in. And that, that is not anywhere near what we should be uh, doing. We, this is going to require lots of local initiative. And, but there's an idea that if potentially uh, has merit in both caring for the food insecure as well as the businesses that are under stress. Uh, we've got between Barry and Montpelier shelters, we've got uh, 30, 60, 75 food insecure people needing to be Fed who are also congregating in unsafe densities. Um, that needs to be spread out, and it, you can't just ship everybody to, to Barry. Um, the noon meat, noontime meals that have been called soup kitchen or community meals have all been discontinued. Um, some of those churches are handing out bag lunches on their scheduled day. But there's four restaurants that I know of. Uh, Positive Pie, uh, Uncommon Market, uh, Alavita, and Mad Taco that are have, are making efforts to stay open. Uh, we have to be taking emergency measures to try to keep this city alive, even on a most modest level. And it occurred to me there might be a nice match there between. Stephen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you here. You're at about three minutes. I, I appreciate what you're saying, um, and I, I think that, because um, I, I think you're, you're headed towards a suggestion, and um, I appreciate that. I want to hear it, um, but let's do it when we are in the suggestion for uh, um, schedule. I, so, um, I if you have any, you, so, so um, which I think we're about to move into anyway, but I'd love to um, start with uh, the, the city's, um, uh, or at least the suggestions that we've put together um, for the for the city, and then um, and then you can you can come back, Stephen, and, and let us know your suggestions. So, um, Mayor. So, are, is Ann, everybody otherwise ready to move on? Ian, you you weren't that clear, but basically, so I'm just going to relay what you yeah. just said. So the next section of the meeting, Steve, is for open suggestions. So all she was saying is she sounded like you were making suggestions and she would be happy to hear that at that time. So she wasn't saying stop, just wait. Okay, you're, you're back. She wants to hear so. Okay, oh. <laughs> great. So the next section. So are, are you, uh, Bill, are you uh, in a place where you're ready to lead us to the next section? Yeah, we both will. Um, so we, and I, I'd like to thank uh, you, Mayor, and also Councilmember Hurl, who had provided an outline of a lot of thinking in advance to us, suggestions that helped us organize our thinking and lay out some of these ideas. So it was very helpful. Um, but as we sorted through, there were certain things that you know we realized the city had no authority to do or couldn't get involved with. But there were some things that we can, and so we've we've tried to lay those out. There are certain things that, that um, the council could just 
write letters or, or statements of support to the people that can make those decisions. There are other things that the city can take specific action on tonight. And then I think as we talked about the next part will be to brainstorm ideas and talk about how um, talk about how you know what we can follow up on. So I'll let Cameron go through the specifics of these potential actions, but I, I, we're hoping that you'll want to take some of these tonight. I think they could have some benefit. So, um, Anne, do you want me to go through these one at a time, or would you like me to read all of them and then we just discuss them all? Uh, I think there are a few. Uh, um, there's a, a, a few enough of them to uh, just go through them one at a time. Okay. So some of the suggestions that we received for the first one on the um, uh, the back of the um, handout is to reach out to utility providers, including internet, um, et cetera, to ensure that they won't shut off their utilities at this time. Um, ensuring that folks have access to testing um, or have the state enact policies ensuring access to that and then work with local businesses to encourage and support them in offering paid sick leave um, to employees. So we understand that this isn't aren't things that we can force people to do but our suggestion would be uh, for council to endorse a letter or something to that effect to these groups if you want to. We're getting nods here, just so you know. How do you feel about sending letters? And we can certainly write those for you to have feedback on. We're not also not supporting that. Yeah. Great. So we're happy to do the drafting. I'm, uh, I'm happy to start talking. I can tell you. But Jack. Dan's claiming the floor. No, no. They're in the collections, the collection related activities already. Could you repeat that, Jack? So we should take them off the list? I would say yes, or maybe send them a letter indicating our appreciation. Yeah, I think they did that through April 30th. Jack? Jack, can you please repeat what you told oh, yeah. Jack was saying that. I think someone was asking me a question, but I didn't hear it. Uh, to repeat what you said. Okay, yes. Green Mountain Power has announced that they are temporarily suspending through the end of April collections related activities, including service disconnections. Effective immediately. Um, regular billing will continue, but they're not. So we don't need to send them a letter asking them to uh, keep people's service on them. But if we're sending letters to other companies, we might send them a letter just saying we appreciate what they're doing. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. I agree. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, um, Mr. J. Um, I, do, I do think it's a good idea to send a letter to Green Mountain Power. I've seen that Comcast has also done the same. Obviously, it's a very different um, type of paper. Maybe sharing that publicly that we appreciate that they're putting off um, any sort of uh, delinquency or shut off for at least 30 days. It's important to acknowledge that that is great. Thank you. Do you need a motion? Andy, you want us to motion you or disagree? <laughs> yes, yes, I, I think that's a good idea. I'll make a motion that we send a letter of appreciation to these providers. GMP and Comcast, and I guess other providers that we know in the area. That are not going to cut off. Um, right. They're not. Service. They're going to keep the services going even if it's an overdue bill. You got yeah. it. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Um, uh, all the say aye. 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 Um, you have to do a roll call. No, only if it's okay. Never mind. No, only if it's uh, um, so, uh, in Yeah, okay. it was unanimous. Sorry about that. Sorry? It was unanimous. Okay, so one more time. <laughs> What's that? It was unanimous. 
It was you to get him back. So it's all, you're all good. <laughs> okay. And, uh, okay. Um, there are other parts of this uh, bullet, though. So Donna's motion was just about appreciating some. Can, just, um, yeah, can you hold uh, on just for a minute, please? We're sorry if this isn't up to your quality control, Steve, but we're trying to conduct a meeting under the best circumstances we can. We realize this is a network television. So commenting and talking to other people while the meeting is going on is not helping under these difficult situations. Thank you. Uh, so regarding other, um, the other bullet, um, yeah. testing question has a little bit of, it's fraught with a little bit more issues. It's not just simply testing for everyone. I, I know I've read articles that suggest, you know, they have to be somewhat artful about the testing that they do because it can give people a false sense of security if they get testing. And so some of the public health science and thought around that still hasn't necessarily congealed. I mean, I, I get the sense that the state um, and the health department are pushing for more testing and more access to testing, but I, I don't know if it's something where we as a city council need to, to ju jump in um, or if our letter would necessarily tip the balance or we'd be walking into a more complicated argument with a very simple statement. I agree. I 
anyone want to make a motion on that one, or shall we uh, move on? I agree. Sorry, let's, let's hear uh, Lauren and then um, whoever else was just speaking. I, like the, that, I, I hear all that. That makes sense to me around testing. I think that issue, you know, it's it, 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 what it is at this point and just following the lead. I think there has been a question raised of access to health care. Like, I'm more talking about the treatment side. Is there any, which I know that the state is and maybe getting letters of support from cities would be helpful as they're looking at possible budget implications and what the state might want to do to help cover people, knowing that we don't want people to not get treated, so then they're going to be in our communities. I mean, it's both an equity issue and a public health risk if we're not helping and treating people, um, depending on ability to pay. Do you want to make a motion regarding that? I'm sorry. Would somebody mind just kind of summarizing yes. what Lauren said? So she said um, to restate what I think Lauren is saying, and she thinks it might be important for the state to have letters of support from municipal or city government uh, regarding um, any budget needs they might have to cover folks who okay. can't afford to get testing um, or, or access, or to, access to healthcare at all. So no, it's less right. about treatment. Testing and more treatment. 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 The word is treatment. treatment. Okay. Um, can, I, can I just throw in one possibility? I'm looking at the other section down there that we haven't gotten to with the evictions, and I would see maybe a letter to the governor and legislature taking some form there with sort of a, a menu of things we'd like to see. So I'm wondering if it might just be a comprehensive one letter as opposed to sort of piecemealing it on this? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Basically, you're taking statements of policy here, and then we'll... Yes. Yeah. I think it would be helpful uh, right, for so everyone there, um, on call regarding to mute themselves because you guys are all talking over each other. So if you're not speaking, if you could mute yourself, that might clear the line for whoever is speaking. They've all muted. Okay, so is there a motion? I move that we include in a letter to the governor and state legislature uh, a request for the state to help ensure there's access to treatment for all Vermonters regardless of ability to pay. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, all right, so moving on. And then uh, working with local businesses to encourage and support them in offering paid sick leave. Uh, Cameron, do you want to tell us, or um, someone? <laughs> uh, either Cameron or Lauren, do you want to talk about that one? Um, th well, that's just coming from suggestions that we've heard from y'all, to be honest. So. If, if I can, I, I think this issue is somewhat related to the subsequent issue about the evictions and foreclosures in that maybe the best way to deal with this, and I was thinking about this today, was, um, you know, Montpelier Alive is already reaching out to local businesses um, and is in good contact with them. And I'm wondering if someone from the city uh, or from our council even should have, be a point person with, with the Montpelier Alive for this specific topic um, to work with them because, you know, on, on the issue of evictions, um, you know, we're in a very unique situation in that there are a number of businesses that are going to be shut down. Um, but unlike other times when landlords may say, okay, well, I need to move to evict because I need to put somebody else in there, no one else can go in there. If you have a restaurant that's closed, it's closed. It's going to always stay closed as a restaurant. 
um, regardless of who the tenant is. And so, um, you know, the, it seems to me that the solutions to a lot of these problems are going to not necessarily be um, a hold off on foreclosures. And, and frankly, the courts have already shut down non-emergency hearings. Um, and so if we can have some type of relationship or, or develop or work with Dan over at Montpelier Alive to start to talk to these landlords, um, maybe even convening a group if it seems, if it seems uh, sensible to, to have these discussions. And then if we can provide anything, any support um, or any direction or coordination, that, that would seem to be more, much more effective than necessarily writing a letter saying, please don't evict people. You would suggest that we just talk with Dan Groberg at Montpelier Live about this topic then? I, I, I would. I mean, that sounds a little wishy-washy, <laughs> but I think it's the best, the best approach, which is that we should have one person from the city um, <coughs> interfacing with Dan and, you know, w w sort of asking these questions and reaching out to him and then <coughs> having that channel of communication so that, you know, if we can make policy, if we can do different types of things to support them, that th we would have that. Um, and that could affect other, other policies down the line because I suspect the answer <coughs> to these problems are going to be more complicated and require more uh, sort of ongoing discussions. Yes, this is Jay. Um, Dan, sorry, you were breaking up a little bit, but um, I actually participated on the, there was a phone call early this morning with the FBA, the Montpelier Business Association, that Dan Groberg uh, oversaw, and I listened in on that, and that was one of the key things that came up in that conversation was being able to communicate with commercial landlords about, um, you know, not forgiveness, but just some ease on and, and some, you know, relaxing of some of the deadlines for rent to help people get through them. So um, I'm more than happy to um, take that on from the city perspective and work with Dan to then coordinate with, with commercial, land, commercial property owners to try to see how they can support local businesses so that they're, they're not dealing with eviction. Um, obviously, as the city, we're not, we don't have authority to say, okay, this is, you, you can't fix somebody, but yeah, I, I will be, I'll take the point on from the city perspective in terms of working with, um, with those commercial property owners and then with their, with the businesses to help try to be as flexible as we all can right now, given the circumstances. Did y'all hear him? Yep. Okay. So Jay said that he would be the council point person to work with Montpelier Alive and the business community about trying to navigate the way through uh, leases, evictions, etc. That sounds good to me. Any other thoughts? It sounds good to me too. One thing I should point out because we've had, as you might guess, a considerable amount of discussion about the uh, the eviction question as legal aid, and it's very clear that uh, the Supreme Court's Administrative Order 49, while it uh, it halts uh, hearings being held, it uh, does not suspend filings or deadlines or anything else. So a landlord could still file an eviction uh, complaint in court. Uh, the tenant's time to respond to that would, would continue to run and so there's people are still potentially at risk to uh to be evicted even during the uh this uh emergency and so communication and encouraging people to uh to be compassionate is a is a important thing right I, I would just yeah, say, if I could jump in. Yeah, I that that's the approach that we need to take with this. And talking with folks at the uh, Appeal Development Corporation and, um, yeah, I mean, taking that approach as well as we're dealing with this as a city, I think is exactly the right path to do. So Jay just said he would talk to the MDC and that he would bring up those legal issues. 
I think you're going to need also need uh, financial institutions involved in this because in many cases the landlords have mortgage payments due. It, it strikes me. Sorry, Connor. Oh, you, no, go ahead. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it strikes me that this is th that the city may be in a unique position, be given that we don't, we're not a bank, we're not a landlord, we're not a business, but it seems that all three of those people are going to have to sit down and talk at the table at some point, and so you know the city's function here may be something where we encourage that type of communication, working with the MDC and Montpelier Alive, trying to get you know these people to talk at the table, understand that there, there's pressures on all three. You know, the banks are driven by federal regulations um, and their, their governance for their loans. The, you know, the landlords are governed by the banks to a certain extent, as well as their other external pressures. And then, uh, obviously, the tenants are sort of at the bottom and are, you know, governed by all of that, plus the whims of fate. Um, so I think if we can get any type of, of conversation going and, and use the city as a, as a neutral to facilitate that in some way, um, you know, I think that's a really effective tool that we can use to help help these businesses um, in this time. I, I would just say in addition to this, I, I would like the city to be on the record in some way of supporting the state coming out with a moratorium on evictions. I, you know, hundreds of municipalities are looking at this right now. Boston just instituted a 90-day moratorium. Um, we're disproportionately impacted by this, having a community of 40% renters. And if, you know, most people spend an average of a third of their salary on housing there, uh, this could hit us pretty hard. I don't think it's gonna hit too many people, uh, but even if it's one or two that makes such a difference there. So just getting on the record with the state in some manner I think would be helpful. And again, uh, I did I reach out to the League of Cities and Towns, uh, both Burlington and Barrie and their charters do give them a mechanism to enforce this. Uh, we, we have nothing, so we are dependent as, uh, you know, under Dylan's rule. Well, I just wanted to let everyone know, I just heard from the mayor, her phone call dropped out. She tried to call back in and it was, she got a busy signal, so she's walking over from her apartment to join the meeting in person. So uh, I guess, Donna, are you the council president? Are they all gone? That was no. Okay. Donna, are you there? She might be on mute. Are you on mute? Oops, sorry. Yes, I am. I okay. muted my button. I'm a good person. You're, you're the presiding officer now until the mayor gets here in person. Okay. Well, if since I'm not visual, I think it's really important that we have one person saying yes. It's your turn to speak, and until you hear that, we don't speak. So are we talking, Reverend, I'm Donna, I want to speak or something because it is hard not to interrupt by the same token then you don't get to say anything. So can we go through Cameron for, for who's talking? Is that possible? Uh, well, we don't hear any better than you do, but yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, but you've got three people there, right? We I have mean, two people here right now. There's several people in the room you're looking at. So, I mean, if I want to speak or Laura wants to speak, just say Cameron, and then you should be the next person that gets the chance to speak. Or they could just address you. You're running the meeting now. Oh, okay. That, that's fine. I just, because I, I'm having a very hard time hearing everybody that's not on the call. People in the room have oh, a yeah. bubble. Someone in the room will let you know. Okay. So was Dan speaking then, or was that Jay? No, no one's speaking now. That's, Bill this is Bill. Who was speaking? This Bill. is Bill. Okay. And discussion about whether or not about renters. Who was the last person who was speaking? Connor. That might have been me. I was suggesting, um, you know, for sending a letter to the governor and the legislature, and I assume our delegation. Uh, we would certainly have the access to testing in there, but I would also uh, like to propose we include a uh, temporary moratorium on evictions uh, that the pa state would pass in one of their emergency bills that they're considering. So Connor has asked- Connor, do you want to make a motion? Um, yes, I'd like to move uh, 
the city supports a, morat a temporary moratorium on evictions um, in a letter to the legislature and governor. That's Jack seconding. Jack seconding, thank you. Anyone want to make a comment about that? I, I, I do. Great. Uh, this is this is Dan Dan's commenting. Um, the, the the one comment I, I I'd add is I think you you find I I agree you know it's a different game with the residential um, evictions um, but I think we find the same pressures that are going to bear uh, on landlords as well as you know uh, in residential as well as commercial which is that you know they have mortgages they have to pay I, I guess I would like an am amendment that that would include um, you know a moratorium not only on uh, evictions, but also on uh, foreclosures um, during this time period as well. Not good. Mr. Parliamentarian, I, can I just consider Your that a friend? Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd offer that as a friendly Thank amendment. You. So for those that were having trouble hearing, Connor had initially moved that, that we uh, go on record as supporting a moratorium on evictions for residents and businesses, and Dan offered a friendly amendment to also include foreclosures, which Connor accepted. Uh, so that's the motion before you. Does Jack need to accept that too? Yes. Jack, are you? I, I accept that also. And the mayor has arrived yeah. in person. So Hello. All right. Do you want to take over Does the Jack meeting? Have a comment? Sure. <laughs> that's there right now? Uh, I just said I was fine with that amendment. Okay. Explain it to you or we can go ahead and vote. Oh, go ahead. You go ahead and, yeah, you go ahead. Sorry, I'm just picking up what's happening. Okay, so I'm calling for a vote on the motion made by Connor, amended by Dan about renters Rentals and foreclosures. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes. Okay. The floor is now yours, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear her? Yes. Loud and clear. Okay. Yeah. Great. Which part do we have to? We're up to parking enforcement. Parking enforcement. Uh, actually, I'm going to let you explain this, Bill. Well, so um, obviously with businesses closed, uh, there is not the demand for parking that we normally see. Our main reason for parking enforcement is to keep spaces open for people. Uh, and it seems somewhat cruel that in a time when we would like people to be visiting downtown, and there are open spaces that we would be charging for parking or fine or ticketing people. We would continue to ticket for uh, things like handicap zones, hydrant violations, blocking driveways, those types of things. But for just general time and meter violations, we would recommend that not we, we waive or suspend, temporarily suspend all collections from meters, temporarily suspend all enforcement of meters, and in fact, that we, we would take the meters, uh, what we call, put them to sleep. They're electronic meters because we have to actually pay a $5 per month per meter activation fee. So by actually turning them off, we'd save about $2,000 a month. Um, so we would, we think that's, council might want to do that. It seems like a great idea to me. This is Jack. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, would anyone like Mrs. to make, Jack, make that? And do you need a motion? Yes, please. Okay, oh. I'll make a motion that we suspend parking, I think, parking fees. The duration of two weeks? I would or say until, you until you uh, further yeah. notice, until you decide not to. I'll second. Okay, we suspend collection parking fees until further notice. And Connor seconded. I'll second that for sure. Okay. And uh, any further discussion? And that includes putting the meters yes, to sleep, one. right? Um, well, yeah. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say what, what Bill said. That includes the other things Bill suggested, including putting the meters to sleep. Yep. Great. That's part of 
their responsibility. We don't need to do a motion for that. That's management of the meters. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a question on that? Just to someone, again, if it's in the contract, but um, would, that, would that potentially free up some resources that we could redeploy the part yeah. of the staff to do some yes. other things around this? Oh, yes, okay. and we are looking at that. Right. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Uh, that passes. Thank you. Uh, all right, property taxes. This is uh, something that we have, well, Bill and I have talked about anyway, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so at this point, you know, our next property tax payments are not due until May 15th, and no one knows what kind of situation we will be in on May 15th. Um, our, our immediate suggestion, uh, so we don't really have the authority to just waive or relieve property taxes. Those have to go through the Board of Abatement. Um, but what we can do is delay the collection time. So we're recommending, at least for now, that we add another 30 days of collection uh, till June 15. And that obviously if people, and we would ask that if people have the means to pay by May 15, that would really be great for cash flow and the ability to do uh, some of these other services we're hoping to do. But that those that wait until uh, June 15, uh, we would not charge interest and penalties until after that. How would it? How would you feel about making that? So, Bill Donahue, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to jump in. Um, how how would you feel about making that July? Um, the only reason is we were, it, it, it has to do with closing out the fiscal year. Yeah. So, I mean, we would we could always reconsider that when we get closer to that time, if if it appears that that's necessary. Um, I, so, I mean, it's obviously up to you. We think it's cleaner, at least for now, uh, in March, to still say June 15. But uh, again, we have to really till May to make that decision. OK, thank you. Uh, Connor, go ahead. No, not looking for a hard number, but about what percentage are on automatic payments for property taxes? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we can get you that information. Think that'll give us a good indication of how much we actually get. The, the question was, what percentage of people are on automatic payment for pro property taxes? And I, I don't know the answer, but we can get that answer. Donna, did you have another Thank question? You. My question was about that when we put out that payment is delayed, we can still encourage people who are able to pay, such as auto payments that they can still pay, it just won't be 15. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Correct. And Jack, did you have something to add? I did. And that was that I don't recall voting on uh, Donna's motion regarding parking enforcement. You, you did. We did. You might have cut out at that point. Okay. We it was okay, very good. We approved it. Any other, um, d unless you want to object? Oh no, I have no objection. I'm in for it. In favor of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on, I just didn't hear it. <laughs> on the this uh, proposal to um, push back uh, at least. Uh, interest in penalties um, to June fifteenth. Uh, Jack or Lauren, did you have any comment on that? I support it. Oh, I'm sorry, Jay. Yeah. Jay. Um, and Dan. No, I was just going to say I'll, I'll make the motion that we uh, delay the fourth installment of the property taxes for the fiscal year twenty. Uh, from May 15th, 2020 until June 15th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. All right, there, uh, any further discussion? Hey, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, all right, that passes, thank you. And we can revisit pushing that further back uh, later on. Um, water sewer bills. Similarly, I guess, you know, at this point, they're not due until June. Um, so I, 
I think we can discuss whether we want to have a collection delay, waiving the fees the same the same way, uh, or we can take this up later when we have a better sense of what's going on. So we don't have as, as firm a resolution on that right now. Uh, Dan. Th this might make sense to take up in, in, in June or in May when we have a better sense. I mean, you know, part of it is that we, we know this isn't necessarily going to resolve itself quickly, um, but at the same time, I think we'll have a better snapshot too of what you know economic harm people are are feeling at that point in time. And I have no problem pushing it forward when the time's appropriate. But it might make sense to do it along with the property taxes, sort of in in tandem, if we are moving beyond the normal cycle. Uh, Connor, anything to add? No, I'd be good with that suggestion. Uh, Donna? No. Okay, I, I'm just going to keep good, rolling through people just because it's easier. Um, Lauren, any thoughts? Next up, me. Jack? I agree. Jay? Yes, I think we, we pick it up when the time is right. Okay, um, is there, uh, oh, Dan, did you make a motion? You don't die. Oh, we didn't need a motion. motion. We're taking it up later. Never mind. Uh, great. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, and capital area neighborhoods. I'm going to speak to that one. Sorry, did, uh, did someone have something to say? No? Okay. Um, so capital area neighborhoods, this is something that, um, keeps coming up in conversations that I'm having. I don't know if you're hearing much about this, but um, lots of folks are asking for it. Um, this was a, um, sort of a, a network of neighborhoods across the city where there was um, usually one uh, leader um, who would uh, be sort of in charge of um, doing things like disseminating information or collecting information. Um, you know, this could be city projects. Uh, so I'm sort of stepping back from just the particular crisis we're in now, but uh, looking more generally, it could be about um, things like uh, letting people know that their street was going to be uh, paved that fall, you know, the coming summer and um, making sure that uh, people were aware that was coming. Um, it could, it could even be as something as, um, uh, you know, re relevant or preventative, uh, like now is just knowing what the resources are in your neighborhood. Um, things like who has a, who has a generator or, um, you know, where, who's growing local food or that, that sort of thing. Um, in this particular situation, um, I think it could be useful to have capital area neighborhoods um, for the purposes of getting uh, uh, basically volunteer forms and need forms to uh, folks who particularly aren't uh, computer savvy. Uh, or maybe they are on computers, but maybe they're just not that exposed to uh, these need forms. Um, so it would be a, a way to do a little bit of a deeper dive into, um, you know, knowing what the needs are in our community. Um, this was a program of the city uh, about 10 years ago, and it sort of fizzled out, but I think it's pretty relevant now. I don't know that this needs a motion. Um, I would sort of volunteered myself to uh, help coordinate this and organize it. Um, I've already started talking to some folks about maybe being leaders, uh, but would love to just open this up for suggestions, thoughts, uh, discussion. Uh, Dan. Uh, I'll offer, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> it's a good idea. Um, and it actually, the mutual aid group may be a logical group to start with to work this out because they've already collected, my understanding is about 100 names. Like 200? Uh, yeah, of people who want to help. And this strikes me as, as one of the great ways in which we could we could organize that on sort of a, a sub, uh, sub city uh, neighborhood level where people can identify needs um, or issues as they arise and then have a way to sort of trickle that up. Um, up to up to the city level um, 
so I think that's that's a great place to start, and I would suggest that. Yep, that's great. And just so you're aware, um, they are. I've been in touch with them. They know that um, that uh, that we're maybe going to work on this, and they see this as a a way to. Um, potentially uh, delegate some of their um, their work in terms of uh, volunteers or, or getting to know people's needs. Um, yeah, so yeah, working closely with them for sure. And? Uh, Donna. Uh, Donna here, and you have time. Yep, go for it, Donna. Uh, I'm really glad you brought this up. I, I think it's a wonderful resource, and it should tie in with our um, consensus, consensus that's going on the national census being taken, that we could really engage in getting their census done. Uh, the brochure that's on the website is the old one. And some of these groups still meet once in a while. Um, so I think it's, I'd love to see it become more strong. The gentleman who talked at our council meetings before felt that it should also be an alert for sexual assault. And I think we should maybe go back in some of the minutes and find some of his suggestions and try to incorporate it. Um, the brochure that's on the website mentions emergency management, community building, and civic engagement. And I, I think it's true for all of those. So thank you for volunteering your time. Yeah, for sure. Um, Connor, anything hey, add? Yeah, no, I think it's uh, great. I think it's going to be a heavy lift to set up, but once you do, uh, it could really be a lot less daunting with some of these things we're talking about as time goes on, so I'm yep. fully supportive. Uh, Lauren. Uh, I, I'm really excited. I think that this is great. Um, I really appreciate you stepping up. One question I had, um, I mean, kind of to what Dave Whitaker was saying earlier, like, so as of now, you are interested in helping kind of see this going. Just thinking about, like, you know, this is a huge kind of assessing and trying to connect community members at this, like, particular emergency moment to services, to food, to medicine, whatever people need. Like, it's a lot to put on volunteers. Um, it's a lot to put on you to make sure the volunteers are happening. And just, like, in this particular case, it being a pandemic, not people will be getting sick or need to be doing caregiving. Um, just, like, thinking through as you're getting it set up, like, what's the redundancy? Like, we, we can't become too reliant on, like, some... Hey, Lauren. Individuals. Lauren, you got to slow down. Yeah. Sorry, hang on, Just thinking about how you're building it in a way that there's redundancy, knowing that a lot of people are going to have a lot of caregiving or sickness themselves to deal with um, in this particular emergency. And, um, you know, I don't know if it does make sense to Stephen Whitaker's point of if there's a staff person who's helping, um, you know, look at what's happening to, it's like knowing that this is really the core of how are we connecting our residents to essential needs like food and medicine and be, like entirely relying on volunteers for this so, particular at this moment. So, thank thank it's you. It's challenging, but just trying to think through that. Uh, thank you for that point. I think that uh, your point is well taken. Um, I, I think it's important to have some redundancy in this uh, in the system. Uh, and so you know also knowing that 211 uh, is out there, uh, I think is important. but also to your point about staff, um, I think uh, actually I would love to uh, hear from Bill or Cameron about well so how it was arranged previously, um, and and then I have an, another idea about about that, but yeah. So it was it was done um, at a time when oil prices, in particular, were quite bad, and people were uh, facing pretty severe needs. It was organized through the planning department. At that point, we had two. Um, <coughs> what's the not volunteers, but the vistas. Uh, vistas. Thank you, two vista people, and they were the staff coordinators for this. So really, they did all the legwork, helping keep keep everything together. 
uh, and you know the list of names and helping set up the meetings and those kind of things. So it, there was a fair amount of legwork done out of this building, um, and it it was with you know Vista Vista staff people. So we'd have to figure out who had those skills, abilities, and time to do that. But it certainly, I mean, keeping our folks safe is top priority so so um, in, in that same uh, spirit I um, I mean so having vistas cost us something mm -hmm. um, I could also picture uh, like this is pretty discreet work in terms of like it's pretty clear that for a city um, for the city's responsibility it would be about communicating and sort of directing mm -hmm. um, D directing information and uh, you know both collecting it and getting it out, um, and that I, I feel like that's pretty finite. Uh, I could also see us having some help from outside organizations. I'm just going to say, for example, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition has is very interested in this. Um, I don't, I'm not necessarily right now suggesting that we just go with them, but that right. we could partner with someone to. Um, Makes sense. To, to do this in the long term. I'm just interested in getting this up and running basically ASAP. Um, and so based on the, just so everyone knows, based on the previous uh, neighborhood uh, delineations, there were 14 regions and we already have two um, uh, volunteers who have said that they'd be willing to be leaders. Um, so just putting that out there. Um, uh, so other comments, um, uh, Jack, anything to add? Nothing to add. Uh, Lauren, any, well, I guess we heard from Lauren. Uh, Jay, anything to add? Uh, nope. Okay, um, Do and Donna, you've, uh, Donna or Lauren, anything more? Okay, and Dan, you're good? No, I was just going to say, I'm happy to help. Okay, yeah. oh, great, awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, well, and I don't think we need a motion regarding that. Um, okay, thank you. So moving on from there, um, so now we're in the brainstorming section. Um, other ideas, I have at least two other ideas um, that I'd like to uh, mention. But um, I'll let others start first, and then once we've gone through uh, anything else, then I, I mean, you probably have something more to add, and I would love to hear it. So. And there are two, two more folks that oh, yes. weren't here at the beginning of the meeting that may, I don't know if they're right. here with comments or not. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, any other suggestions? Connor. Um, I, I was talking to. Get make it closer, man. Sure. I was talking to Mary Hooper there, and uh, you know she made the good point that you know I think a lot of hourly workers in town don't know that they're eligible for unemployment. Um, so I, I think it'd be great if we could just have a really clear link on the web page to that. There's an eight to ten day processing delay, is my understanding now. So anybody watching uh, would really recommend you get those. You get that in ASAP. And at the moment, I don't think that covers anybody under like 1099s or something, but they should probably keep an eye out too because things are changing all the time with the rules. Uh, but if we could have a link on the website, just uh, point them in that direction. Uh, Dan. Uh, two things. One, uh, I discussed earlier when I was on the uh, Homeless Task Force conference meeting with, with Cameron, the idea of linking Montpelier Alive, who seems to be really taking the lead on or communicating with businesses to establish who's open, who's closed, who's available for certain services. And I think we just need to make sure that we cross, cross post with them um, and coordinate. And the second thing is actually, um, <clears throat> sorry if you can't hear me. Um, the second thing is, is actually a project that uh, I'm going to start working with uh, two of the lawyers from Legal Aid on tomorrow, is that um, there's going to be a lot of credit card use in the next several months as people lean heavy into that where they don't have the resources um, and there's going to need to be some guidance on that. So hopefully whatever we develop from that we can post on the, on the city's website because I think that's going to be a really important piece of consumer information. Um, just because there are there are things people can do now and in the short term to lessen any burden that comes from u utilizing those credit cards and the consumer debt that comes with it. 
Do you have any, like an example or? Uh, well, just, just as a, a, for example, I mean, the classic thing is that, you know, knowing that it's 18% interest that can be charged, um, paying, paying certain minimums, the idea that consumer debt is ultimately, while it's bad, it's not, as, it's not like a mortgage. They can't take away your home. They can't take away certain things. And so, you know, if you do find yourself leaning on it so heavy that you don't, you fall into a hole of, of knowing who to approach to help you with that type of situation so you don't make bad decisions such as taking out a mortgage or reverse mortgage. I mean, you see a lot of this in the elderly where they have a credit card debt and they lean on it and then they you know, get scared because they have this debt so they take a reverse mortgage, which is the worst thing in the world you can possibly do because now people can take away your home kind of things. But you know, so, so, so issues like that that people can be aware of with, I think, their credit card um, is just, it's, it's more of a general service, but I, I do think it would be important to post on the city website. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jay, anything uh, that you want to suggest? Um, no, I, 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 I had a, hard time, a bit of a hard time hearing Dan, but I just um, <laughs> want to point out uh, for, speak to his first point that um, that the Montpelier Live take a lead on connecting with local businesses um, and supporting them. And like, like I said before, I was, I was part of uh, Dan uh, Grover had a call with the NBA this morning. Um, and it's what Dan is doing a, a fantastic, incredible job of um, keeping people positive and also um, providing all the resources that are coming from the federal government, that are coming from the state, and and also you know anything that we can do locally to support them. But I, I just think it's important to acknowledge uh, the good work that Dan's doing and Montpelier Alive is doing to help support you know our local businesses through and, uh, through this process. Great, thank you. <laughs> Um, Jack, anything to add? Yes, the the one thing, um, following up on what Connor said, the uh, Department of Labor is now accepting uh, online uh, filing for unemployment, and so that that should be part of what we put on the web page, and that should uh, help people uh, get their claims filed and get get through. But I don't have any additional ideas to uh, suggest at this time. Okay. Uh, Donna, anything uh, you want to add? Well, only one thought that maybe I should give to Jay to give to Dan Grover is that I feel we can support our local businesses by reaching out and buying gift certificates now when they might need some cash flow. And not just in restaurants, but in our stores in general. And that maybe Monte Your Life could do a campaign around that. And uh, I'm really positive about the neighborhood aspect, and I'm glad to see that being revitalized. That's all. Great. Um, Lauren. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Donna. I know that's definitely on uh, Dan's radar and something that Monte Your Life is working on. Thank you for that. Great. Uh, Lauren, anything to add? Um, one thought, just wondering uh, about coordinating more closely with the school system. I know they've been putting a ton of thought into things like how are they getting meals to kids who normally rely on food and stuff, and they were packing that idea there, some of which is reflected a little bit in the memo from the city, but um, things like delivering, using the school to, to deliver meals to people, and just, it, it seems like it would be great to explore with them, you know, what services they're trying to get out there, and how the city might partner with them on any of it, um, so I would just encourage us to kind of maintain better communication or look, look for opportunities there. Um, and just, you know, however we're continuing to meet um, weekly or whatever we need during this um, emergency and just trying to get input from the public and the business community on, you know, what are the urgent needs, you know, being nimble, what are the kind of things the city can be doing to help. 
May I jump in for just a moment? This yes, is sir. John Odom. Um, I just forwarded you all a letter from Teresa Murray Klassen about just what you're talking about. It came in this afternoon while I was out of the doctor, so I apologize. But there is information in your inboxes that might help facilitate that. I think she might have even wanted some of that um, read into the record, and maybe we can do that towards the end. Uh, there were a couple relevant parts that I think would be good to just, um, maybe not the whole thing, but at least uh, right. uh, part of it. But um, actually, maybe I'll just do that right now, <laughs> since we're talking about it. Um, so the, the part, I, really, she was, um, so she was writing on behalf of um, PIE, which I think is, um, oh, it's Partners in Education uh, for Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. Um, and she was uh, mostly in this letter emphasizing coordination uh, between the city and um, the school district and, and just breaking down silos in general, like having um, lots of uh, communication and partnership um, across uh, across groups, and she wanted to note that uh, the partners in education um, were ready to help meet um, some needs, and those included um, child care support, um, meal prep distribution, uh, financial assistance. Um, noting that they have a great track record for fundraising, um, emotional emotional and social support. Uh, curriculum support, communication support, um, ga grassroots community organizing. Um, and then she also brought up this idea of uh, uh, some kind of a task force. Um, that may be something that we want to revisit. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that that, um, that was out there. Um, she had a really lovely closing paragraph also, but I'll let you read that. Um, in any case, um, where were we? We were talking about going connecting across. Connecting with the schools. Connecting with the schools. Um, and Lauren, was there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, I think that was it for now. I think there's a couple of ideas you might talk about. Um, okay, and um, Adrian, do you want to add anything? And if you do, uh, you should come up to this microphone. <laughs> to the mic, to the table, if you, <laughs> yeah. if you dare that get that close I'll, to us. I'll move over here. Oh, you going to just sit there? Or? No, just to We just want to make sure you were distanced okay. from yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. That has been disinfected. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I actually came If um, you wouldn't mind introducing because, yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, Adrian Brownlee. I own Alavita in town on State Street. And I'm here because Stephen Whitaker had approached me yesterday and emailed me again today about an idea, and he has since left, so I don't really feel comfortable speaking in his, in his place, but um, I can just say that he uh, approached me with the idea that there's a possibility that maybe Meals on Wheels needs help or, or uh, the homeless uh, population needs help um, with providing food and there are some businesses open in town so maybe there could be a collaboration um, and I'm willing to help with that and that's why I showed up tonight. Um, certainly would not be able to donate my time or the food uh, given the fact that business is pretty dismal at, at the moment but in an effort to keep my business open I would be willing to subsidize and and give help if it's off, if it's needed. Um, but there was a report earlier at the meeting that Meals on Wheels is comfortable with where they're at right now, so maybe they don't even we need help. We will always I, take help. Okay. I, I just put that right. out there. They, they feel comfortable in the staff that they have to continue to provide that service okay. at the level that they've been providing it. But mm -hmm. as soon as people start getting sick, and as you may or may not know, the community may or may not know, is a lot of the people who volunteer for that service are vulnerable populations themselves. I see. So right now we're okay, but that can change any second. So we are actively always looking for help in and it's, Meals on Wheels. So there's Meals on Wheels and there's also like the community lunches. Yeah. And again, that's 
volunteers that are preparing those lunches. And I think what Steve started to say um, in the chaos of it all was perhaps the, the idea might be we could purchase food from yes. the yeah. restaurants and provide those lunches that way so that mm -hmm. people didn't have to come in to do the preparation. Mm -hmm. I, think mm -hmm. I think that's worth yep. talking about. Yep. Sure, and I'd be willing to help with that provided that my business is still open. Sure. And you know, that's changeable daily, so anyway. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, okay, I have a few ideas that I oh. want to um, oh yes, Dan. Sorry, I had uh, one one additional thought that I, I forgot to mention before. That I forgot to mention before, and that's uh, I just wonder um, if there shouldn't be some type of encouragement for people to walk downtown. Um, and this goes to I think the public safety issue, which is with these businesses closed um, and with fewer normal foot traffic, you know, it does create sort of opportunities. Whereas if people were encouraged to walk within safe social distancing, can you hear better? Okay, safe social distancing. But I, I, I think we should be encouraging people to to walk through our city to keep it to keep it populated, so it doesn't become a ghost town full of opportunities. Um, Cameron. So something exciting that I touched on a little bit in the memo um, that we're doing is the rec center is coming up with a really fun, we think, program where we're going to do like a scavenger hunt that um, encourages folks to see a lot of our downtown and our other rec facilities like our paths and those the parks. So we're hoping that we can get that information out soon. Um, to sort of encourage that kind of behavior. Um, we know it's not the answer, the only right. answer, but it's part of it, so. Great. Thanks, sorry. No, it's awesome. Um, so all of my um, suggestions, <laughs> except one, um, are really related to the city finances. And so I'm very interested to see uh, sort of where we stand and how much flexibility we have. Um, I mean, this is unprecedented, and so I don't mind doing things that are unusual. Um, and so keeping that in mind, I um, would like to know, f first of all, to free up money on our end. What is our flexibility to push off purchases, particularly like from our equipment plan, um, or, it, or thinking about our um, expenditures we have yet to, to uh, have happen in the FY20 uh, fiscal year regarding uh, capital projects, um, if there's any flexibility there. And then two, considering the same for FY21. Um, what are the essential sort of like must do projects and what can be, um, can be put off? Um, I, I think this is a, a, an okay time to, um, to delay things knowing that we might have to make up for it later. But I'm particularly picking on capital in, uh, improvements or capital money as well as uh, equipment, and I know that's technically the same pot, but um, because those are more or less one-time expenditures and we could potentially shift our equipment plan uh, back a year, um, knowing that at least this kind of crisis is um, going to be at least relatively short-lived um, and the fiscal year sort of scale. Um, so. I would like to. I would like to know how much we can free up, uh, just generally, um, and then with that in mind, um, I have a couple of proposals for what to do with that. One is. Um, uh, so one is dealing with um, residents who may not be eligible for um, unemployment, particularly self-employed folks. Um, I, w I would love to see if we can uh, put together some kind of a like miniature like jobs program, um, which is to say, could we pay people, even as slim as it is, um, some kind of temporary work to uh, pick up litter or paint over graffiti or do trail work or clean out invasive species. Um, there's all kinds of things that we could uh, be exploring. And I know that that wouldn't help everyone, but it might be valuable to a few people. Um, and, and in the end, we may decide to not do that, and that's okay, but I just want to put that out there as an idea. 
Um, and then the second thing is regarding businesses. Um, I know particularly the first floor uh, retail and restaurants are um, nervous right now, and understandably so. Um, I would love to explore, well actually first of all, I would like to know how much we collect in taxes from first floor uh, retail and uh, restaurants. Uh, and then, you know, compare that with the money we freed up. Uh, but looking at if it would be possible to create a program in which landlords could opt in to uh, a program in which uh, they reduce their rent or waive their rent. Uh, either for one month or for the duration, we can figure out what details make sense there, uh, to uh, be basically matched um, potentially by, um, I, by what I would consider like a, a tax break, but I know we, we can't technically, like this body doesn't have the authority to abate taxes. I don't know if that extends to tax credits. Um, I would have thought that that would come to us, but I am surrounded by smarter people. So um, happy to, or, or if there's other mechanisms we can um, use there to get money basically back to to landlords so that they can reduce rent or, um, uh, or waive rent, particularly for first floor, ground floor uh, retail and restaurants. Um, I know I'm going kind of fast. Um, I have one more suggestion, but it's a little weirder. Um, so, uh, Dan. Well, I just, I, I mean, I think that the whole idea of taxes, because it may require some sort of legislative authority, but that strikes me as one of those great ideas that would be best if the landlords themselves bought into it or felt that that would be productive as opposed to, you know, I think that's a great tool for Jay to take with, with his as, as an idea in his box to so, say, if this works, let's let's refine and champion that kind of thing. I've been on the phone today with four major landlords in town, and they have all expressed interest in this. Great. Yep. Um, now, to be fair, the money that we have available that we can free up may not compare uh -huh. to um, rent for a month. <laughs> um, but even if we can do some portion, that might, may still be worth talking about. Um, there are details that would obviously have to be set up for that, but. Um, we can, I mean, it's not going to happen right, you know, we're not going to necessarily decide that tonight. <laughs> um, also, uh, well, any other comments on either of those ideas, either um, some kind of like a miniature jobs program or um, rent relief um, directed through landlords? So at this point, you're just saying collect all the information. Let's see, let's see, let's see how big that pot of money is, yes. and then decide from there. But yes. conceptually, going forward, is it worth considering? Right. R right. I guess that's. And I, I would say both are worth considering, but yeah. Okay. Once we see the details. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, I don't know those numbers either. I don't know that anyone does at, right right now. So, um, uh, on those two things. Uh, yes, Donna. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I like the idea, but I do caution us. This may go on for months, people. So I like the idea of looking at creating a pot, but not, not being too quick of how it goes out until we have a more holistic view. OK. Point well taken. Um, Lauren, I to, uh, yeah, Lauren, go ahead. I agree uh, with the comments so far. I think um, I think there are interesting ideas that we should definitely um, explore and look into. It seems uh, like part of that, maybe to Donna's point, of looking at what the stimulus package and other things that might be coming out of the federal government. 
So, Lauren, you kind of cut out there, but I think I know uh, where you were uh, going to go with it. City, um, or later that could be paid back or something, but just kind of being nimble to what opportunities might come up and maybe we can be more um, you know, quick in getting stuff out from the federal government and that alone might help float our businesses or so are you so you're suggesting that so you're suggesting that together with um with this suggestion we also look at potential uh money that may be coming from the feds or the state uh specifically for small business relief yeah just look at the full picture of what what could come out and you know maybe have some different different options depending on what ends up being available but including um as you suggested looking at what the city alone might be able to do uh, that maybe we have tiers or, or different things that we could do if different pots of money become available through um, state or federal programs great um jay anything to add to that you know, I agree with Lauren. I think that um, looking at those state and federal funds, are, I, I agree with her. Jack, anything to add? Well, I agree with most of what I've heard. I like the idea of figuring out how much money we can flex in our budget. Um, and I agree with uh, Donna's point that, uh, you know, given the fact that we can assume that a, a vaccine may be available in a minimum of a year to a year and a half, I don't think we can predict. Yeah. Fair, fair enough. Um, the only other um, idea I had, which really pertains to Jack in this conversation mostly is because, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the groups of people that are, that might use some help. You know, I was thinking about businesses and residents, um, you know, the underemployed right now, uh, but also uh, just people, just renters. Um, and so, Jack, I'm wondering if you can comment on the possibility of using housing trust fund money for anything regarding uh, relief for renters at this point. Jack, are you still on the phone? I, I just got disconnected and I just called back. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I'm going to repeat what I just said then. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, this suggestion mostly pertains to you as our rep on the Housing Trust Fund. Uh, so uh, just considering financially vulnerable uh, people during this time, and one of those groups is renters, um, wondering uh, about the possibility of using any housing trust fund money uh, to address, uh, well, renters, but really any housing related yeah. issues yeah. at this point. Go ahead, Jack. Or maybe not. Maybe I'll just let that one hang for now. Um, and actually, there's there's one other. I feel it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Everyone needs to mute their phone. Pat, I'm going to suggest that we talk offline because I'm not hearing anything that you're saying. OK. Yeah, no worries. We'll do that. Um, Sorry about that. Um, Okay. I heard you say it was vulnerable. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. We will have different technology next meeting. Great. I <laughs> promise? Maybe even better. Maybe. It will be different. Uh, Lauren. Promises. Promises. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay. So, um, at this point, this is all that we had regularly planned. Any other comments folks want to make at this point? Uh, Connor, go ahead. Just bouncing off your last idea there, just looking at other pots of money, and you know, it's out of our control at this point, but is it worth reaching out to the uh, Montpelier Development Corporation or the community fund there, who we've given money to recently? as this is sort of a core part of their mission to keep downtown alive here and everything. Uh, but maybe rather than bringing you know, new projects in at this point, the focus should be on keeping the lights on in some of the shops here. Um, so it might be worth a conversation with them uh, since we've appropriated $100,000 for the next fiscal year. Correct, so the community fund, of course, um, has, has already committed the funds for our next year's budget. Those are the, the awards that go to nonprofits. Um, we have been in contact with MDC, and I think Montpelier Live is as well, about ways that they can okay. assist in that. Um, could we ask them to come to our next meeting and tell us their plans? Sure. Um, particularly because uh, I, I think it's important that they hear from us that I mean I know we are not their board. No, I understand. Uh, but but that you know we expect that they will be uh, creatively helping to maintain, and and that uh, you know if they need to assign a person mm -hmm. to be in charge of overseeing that, then fair. But redirect the rest of the money to to mm -hmm. keeping downtown alive. And and I, I guess I'd add. We have businesses in the community that are not downtown. They're also vital partners. Yes, okay, yes, so. fair, fair. <clears throat> okay. And, I, and this is Jay. I think that's a great idea. To have the two things come to the next meeting. I, I'm just going to toss in one thing here, and I, it's, you know, there's always got to be the one bureaucrat in the room, right? So that's me. Um, I appreciate the idea. So we have already begun the process of trying to identify funds, um, budget funds, as, as the mayor recommended. I would remind you that we, we've got to balance that against potential lost revenues. So you know, we free up two or three hundred thousand dollars in projects, and we're going to lose two or three hundred dollars in lo local options tax. We're still no, we're, we're still not ahead. So just keep that in mind that it's it's a two way street. So we're trying to do that analysis. We obviously would love to be able to provide the assistance that we need, and we'll be looking to do that. Um, but just it's not. It, we've got to look at both sides of the equation. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, just just along those lines, uh, both Bill and Cameron. If anything approaching, I, I think layoffs uh, finds its way into like a rescission plan or anything. If we could just get a lot of notice on that, because I know personally, uh, I don't want to be in the business of putting more people on the unemployment line. And I think our staff is thin as it is. We need all hands on deck here. So uh, that would be our we last agree. case resort, in my mind. Yeah, I agree with you. I I agree as well. Um. Okay, uh, Dan. Uh, I, you know, I guess one, one thing that uh, maybe is a, a final thought is that, you know, uh, on the call today with the, the um, Homelessness Task Force, you know, there was an undercurrent um, that people are starting to have anxiety about what's going on. Um, and I don't think it would be a bad idea it's the double negative. I think it would be a good idea if, if we as the city, you know, the, the, the mayor, the council, the manager, the clerk, you know, the staff send a letter to the public, you know, reassuring them of a lot of what we've talked about tonight, um, letting them know that, but also defining what we're here to do, which is, is not to provide some of these social services, um, but we're here to make sure that the core services are here and that we, the water will be clean, the sewer will be treated. Um, you know, we will continue to provide public safety and fire safety. You know, this, these functions will continue and that we, you know, continue to have these underpinnings, which, you know, are not the most glamorous thing, but the difference between clean water coming out of your faucet and not is, is between civilization and not in a lot of ways. And so I think maybe sending a letter telling, telling the people and citizens of Montpelier, you know, what we're doing and that we have their back on these core issues, I think is really, really important. I agree. 
Um, I well, so Bill and I have been talking about uh, having more frequent communication with the public as well. But I, I like this idea of having like a kind of like a comprehensive um, letter about just what you're describing, right. and also um, maybe having some direction about um, you know if you're elderly, here are. Uh, you know some resources. If you have kids who need to be fed, here are resources, um, and something maybe that we could just mail to every resident, um, potentially. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in some ways that's a that's a great that's a great idea, and I, I, I applaud your and and, and Bill's work, uh, like Friday with the, the the press conference. I mean, the you know the public availability because I think those are important hallmarks because especially as we become more socially isolated um, throughout this you know unlike other crises where we can all come together and burn the bright lights brightly in the pubs and such you know this is forcing us to be alone and so more communication like this that you can do and that we can do I think is important yeah that was great that live stream yeah, yeah. it was cool okay well I appreciate everyone's Willingness. Can, and I, can I ask one yeah. last thing? Sure. Um, as we think ahead, um, I heard Lauren mention you know maybe more frequent meetings to, regardless of the technology, uh, to deal with these things. And, and maybe we could talk about this next week. But I'm wondering, we had a few things like continued ordinance review and some of that stuff. Is that stuff we should just be? not focus on so we can keep our focus on this or do you want to keep going business as usual so maybe something to think about um, and you know you and I could talk about that obviously we, have, we may have some key issues but even then if we have to do presentations that might be a little tricky but we you know if someone might maybe we can figure out how to do them remotely on the screen or something but so I think if there is a I imagine there will be essential business that we have to get done for example right. we need to probably sign um, right. oh, yeah. documents so um, or if there are other items <laughs> like like that that we have to do fair enough what are other people's thoughts on the sort of the well uh, uh, particularly about like let's say next week's meeting I, I'm also open to meeting um, more frequently if there is substance to talk about um, like I don't know how long it will take staff to come up with some answers for some of the things we raised tonight um, if you think it will take a week then maybe that's not logical to meet sooner but otherwise um, well, we had next week scheduled anyway of course yeah what are what are your thoughts do you want to meet sooner and or do you what how do you feel about moving on with like things you know are norms or <laughs> well, you know other stuff yeah go ahead dan i'll i'll, I'll, I'll speak first uh, only because you keep looking at um, well, um, yeah. that's okay it's where we're sitting <laughs> yeah. um but w w what i would say is something like the norms I, I don't feel that they are as critical at, at a juncture like this i mean maybe we can have them if we have time because they do sort of form some of the underpinning of us but i I don't feel a need to meet before next week. Um, I think next week we do have to think about, you know, sort of where we sit and whether it makes sense. You know, it, B Bill and, and Cameron can do a lot because they have the executive function. So it isn't like, we're not like a select board where we have to meet, otherwise this, the town yeah. doesn't function. Yeah. Um, but then, but but then I, I think the other thing is um, you know this type of meeting is really important to get some essential business done, but it's also the public forum where people can express concern. Dan's just not hearable online. Okay, I will remind okay. everyone to put your phone on mute when you're not speaking. Thank you. It, is it? I'll, I'll try and do it with no, the mic. His voice keeps bubbling. How, it's a relationship to the mic. Okay. I'll, I'll, 
I've moved the mic a little bit. How's this? I, the, the point I was making, just a quick recap maybe, is I don't think we need to meet before next week because I think um, th we, we've already discussed a lot of this. And the second point that I was making was that you know the, the meeting isn't necessarily critical because we have these two full-time executives in, in the city manager and assistant city manager who can do the business of the day-to-day -day, uh, of the city. So unlike a select board that might have to meet just simply to do some of the business, some of that is off our plate. But I do think that these meetings are important as public dissemination opportunities for the public to express any concerns or issues that they have, as well as for us to communicate to the public and to say, hey, this is what we're doing. And for you know these kind of robust discussions that I think ultimately make people feel better because um, that shows that this isn't just haphazard and that there's some thinking and planning and process and good minds and hard, hard shoulders at work here. Um, and so that would be my sense is that, you know, I think we can probably strike a balance somewhere between we may have to meet more than the twice a month, but I, I don't feel like it's as necessary as, um, you know, it's not like we have to now meet every week because we have to deal with these crises because I think the executives can. Um, and so, you know, I think we can have that mixture of essential business, moderate business, and then sort of crisis business. One last question, and this is... Well, actually, before, um, anyone else want to weigh in on the question of uh, uh, meeting more frequently? And then there was one other part. Um, sort of going on with the ordinance reviews oh, going and on, things right, like that. Not, right, not essential things. Uh, Connor. Yeah, I, I, I think I pretty much agree with Dan there. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think the public's too interested in us pouring through uh, ancient ordinances at this point. Um, and even something like the council retreat, which I, I hope we can do if we have time, uh, but I think that should play second to uh, making sure we keep everybody afloat here during this difficult time. So, um, you know, I, I think most of us would be willing to meet as frequently as we need to. Uh, we also don't want these meetings to take up a lot of Bill and Cameron's time when they need to be doing other, other things as well. So, um, yep, that's where I'm at. Uh, Donna, any thoughts on this? had to unmute you. Um, I think we should only meet if we need to. Uh, if we need an extra meeting and we absolutely have things that need it sooner than later, I, I look for Bill guidance on those items and yours. Otherwise, I think we should try to commit to be as timely as we can and as brief as we can in these phone calls. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, Lauren. Yeah, I generally agree with people's sentiments. Um, I mean, I do wonder if making the space for weekly check-ins, you know, at a normal council Wednesday times um, for now and reassessing that. I, I'm almost thinking even if it's just a quick check-in of here's what's happening, here's what the city's doing, and, and just having the chance for public input as more and more of this kind of plays out, like what are people's needs, are there gaps in services, or are there issues that are coming up, and even if it's really a brief meeting, great, but just giving both the public a venue to hear what's going on and to get input from people seems valuable. Yeah. Like not more often than weekly, but. Okay. Um, uh, Jack. I agree with uh, what Donna and Dan said. I also uh, have heard from people that uh, things like the video that uh, the manager did to put up very quickly as a, a summary of what the city's doing are useful and it might be good to do more of that kind of thing. Great. Um, Jay. Yeah, just agree. The more I think, the more we can connect and connect with the community, the better. So, however that looks with meeting, um, you know, I'm open. You know, it's occurring to me too that it feels really pressing right now, and there are things to be decided. Um, but sooner or later, like we're going to figure out those things, and 
and then it might actually be nice to talk about anything else. Um, and, and, and actually for that, you know, as long as we are dealing with the, what needs to be done, if there is space and time for our reg with our regular meetings, it might actually be nice to talk about something that feels low pressure. Um, we, can, we can talk about this yeah. later, but um, you know, and I'm thinking about like ordinance review, you know what I mean? Um, but in any case, um, happy to take anybody's input on that as we go on. Um, sounds like we're in general agreement and that, that's, that's pretty good. Bill, you had another question. I just had a, this is really a logistical question and, and there's no right answer, but it's good for us to know to help prepare. At last week's meeting, we talked about these meetings going forward and at that point, the general sentiment was we were gonna try to hold these meetings in person. Um, and then, our, but a lot's changed in the world since then as well. Um, and then tonight, it seemed like most people wanted to call in. And if, if the if the idea is we're going, these are going to be primarily call in remote meetings, then we will really try to figure. You know, we'll try to configure tech one way. If it's going to be generally, the intent is people will be here, and there might be one call in person, then then that's a different. Thing. So I, it would just be helpful to know what what the collective intent is, uh, and then we can take it from there. I well, so I'll speak first here. I would prefer remote. Um, people can come if they want, but as long as school is closed, I would rather not be here. But that's uh, that's you know m me oh, and my risk aversion. Um, other thoughts? Uh, I'm just going to go in that same order. Uh, Dan. Well, uh, that, yeah, I, I understand the risk averseness. I, I just think that these are certain meetings that are best conducted in person. And, you know, uh, I understand we can probably get better technology, but it's, it's always just hard when you can't read the facial expressions of the person to understand if you're connecting with them or if you're just droning on. Um, which I maybe do. <laughs> okay. Would would video conferencing help? I you know I'll obviously I'll, I think this is an issue where if the if the council decides one way I'm comfortable with it. it it's just if you ask me what my preference is, mm -hmm. I, I I I think that this is important business and I'm willing to make that that risk, okay. but not judging in any way, yeah, shape, yeah. or form anybody else's. I understand. All good, uh, Connor. I think I'm the same. I don't. I don't want to push people outside their comfort zones or anything if they don't feel comfortable coming in. Um, I uh, yeah, I don't do well on the telephone meetings there, so my preference is to come in in person. But t totally understand it. Okay, uh, Donna. Uh, Donna. Yeah. Might be thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I prefer to be in person. I have a bit of a sore throat, so I, it was the only time I reason I stayed home this time. I prefer it in person. It just never works as well. But that's my preference. Okay, uh, Lauren. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think meetings are always better in person. I do. I don't know, again, seeing how things are playing out, I think it might become more and more like we'll need to or want to be doing it remotely. So I do think having the technology, um, I mean, and it, for the counselors too, it's one thing, but uh, you know, like most people are being told to stay home. So to ensure that there's you know, ability for people to participate remotely, just get it, it seems like that technology, having it feasible for people to really do that. You know, worthwhile personally but okay. uh, Jack I uh, I'm like everyone else I think I have a strong preference or most people I have a strong preference for being there in person um, if I get a negative test result uh, today I would expect to be there next week um, I think, but I do think we need to be prepared for the, uh, to do a better job of doing these meetings uh, remotely because I think it's inevitable that some people are likely to need to be participating remotely. Yeah. Yep. And
and Jet. Yeah, I'm right. Yeah, I'm going to have to be there in person. Yeah. I, I do think that, you know, if there's, if there's a, a second choice, it's by video. Um, I also think we have a responsibility that um, if we need to have social, you know, if we're teaching our city to have social isolation and, and separation that we're, you know, doing that ourselves. So I think that if we can find responsible ways to um, be able to still hold a meeting and, and show some leadership there, I think that that's important. Um, so, yeah, those, those are the, the two best preferences. I think by phone is just, it's tricky and problematic. I think that there's technology that we could use for video that so we can at least teach each other and, and have those, those cues, I think would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, fair enough. Uh, I, I think if we do meet in person, um, I'm just going to say I don't know that the distances are enough. I'm glad we're all spaced out here. Um, and I think if we were, if more of us were in attendance, we would just need to figure out that configuration. Um, so oh, I'm open to that. Um, yeah, so right, we need to uh, definitely have some better technology um, as well. Okay, any, any other final thoughts? One thing uh, just to say is like... I just want to thank the staff for their efforts and it's not their fault, we're just not there yet. So uh, just appreciation for setting this up for what we do have. Yes. Uh -huh. Agreed. Uh, Connor. Agreed. Yeah, uh, along those lines, totally I don't agree. think people can necessarily see at home, but we have every department head in the audience right now socially distancing themselves. But <laughs> um, I think if there's any question that the, the city is open for business, you know, just look at the dedication of our staff here. Uh, i got the clerk and Bill and Cameron have been working off the hook, so I uh, really appreciate all their efforts. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we should applaud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, and I also just want to um, thank any of the public who took the time to watch or listen uh, to this meeting and just, uh, you know, stay grounded and uh, encourage people to reach out if they need anything. Um, there are lots of people who want to help and uh, we have great we have great nets for people, you know, if, if you need help. So, um, and I, I think your suggestion, Dan, is great. We'll be in touch uh, more frequently, um, especially as, uh, you know, we're a little, a little more separated from each other these days. So, um, okay, any other comments from uh, department heads? Uh, okay, all right, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, you hopefully can get to bed on time. <laughs> um, so we'll uh, consider the meeting adjourned. Uh, 847.